Okay. Well, it looks like it's time to get going here. And I just wanted to say aloha, everyone, and welcome to a special presentation hosted by Maui Nui Marine Resource Council on shark research in Hawaii with an emphasis on Maui with our guest speaker, Dr. Kim Holland. We're very excited that you're all here. I'm Darla Palmer Ellingson, your MC, and also the host of the public affairs show, Island Environment 360, Maui's only commercially broadcast public affairs show on environmental topics and related Hawaiian cultural issues aired on the stations of HYA Media. Tonight's presentation is part of Maui Nui Marine Resource Council's Know Your Ocean monthly speaker series, usually held on the first Wednesday of each month at 5.30 via Zoom. This monthly series is supported by the County of Maui Mayor's Office of Economic Development. And a few things before we get going, you're, you'll notice that your microphone is on mute. So please keep it on mute during the presentation to avoid distractions. But we do invite you to submit questions using the questions button on the lower edge of your screen. And we'll leave time at the end of the presentation to answer your questions. We might take a couple you know, during, during the presentation as well. We'll see how that goes, but definitely we'll have some Q&A time. And if you're watching on Facebook Live, you're invited to submit your questions too in the comment section of Facebook. We have somebody that's gonna be monitoring that for us and they'll be relayed to us over here. And now it's my pleasure to introduce you to our presenter, Dr. Kim Holland, research professor at the Hawaii Institute of Marine Biology at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. Dr. Holland is the founder of the Shark Research Group at Hawaii Institute of Marine Biology. For over 40 years, Dr. Holland's research has focused on the biology and movement patterns of large marine fishes, such as tuna, billfishes, and sharks. He's been a pioneer in helping to develop and deploy cutting edge tracking technologies that allow unprecedented insight into the movement patterns of marine fishes. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Kim Holland. Well, th thank you, Darla. And thanks very much to the Maui Nui Marine Resource Council for inviting me to give a, a presentation. Um, Hawaii is probably the best place in the world to do shark research uh, for many reasons. One is that we have many species of sharks here and they're here almost all the year round. And we also have access to those animals within a few hours or sometimes a few minutes from shore. And so taking advantage of that over the years, the research group, Hawaii, uh, the shark research group at the Hawaii Institute of Marine Biology, we've looked at all different kinds of things. We've looked at, um, biology of, of hammerhead sharks, the adults and the pups, of deep sea uh, sharks like uh, six gills. Um, and we've looked in captivity at the ability of these animals to detect electrical fields, to detect the Earth's ma magnetic field. So it's a wonderful place to do shark research and we're at the forefront of that. But what I'm gonna do today um, is to concentrate on the work that we've done over the years uh, on tiger sharks primarily because they are the shark species which in Hawaii is most frequently responsible for shark attacks. So with that, I'm gonna see if my technical skills are up to sharing my screen. Um, let me just see here. I think we're getting close to success. Um, rats, I need to be able to move this across my screen somehow. <laughs> I can't get to the part where it tells me to, uh, I can't get to the part where, because the, um, oh, here we go. Yeah, we got it, we got it here. Okay, let's try this. Are you folks seeing that? It looks good. It looks okay. Good, Kim. Yeah, looks good. Okay. So here we go. The first thing I have to do is recognize that 
all shark research that we do in Hawaii is very much a team effort. And some of the people here are, that, are, that are on the uh, acknowledgements, my colleagues, Carl Meyer, Melanie Hutchinson, James Anderson, Mark Royer, and Danny Coffey are instrumental in the work that I'm about to share with you. I'm also very proud to say that all of those folks are graduates of our lab and got their doctoral degrees with me. And in some of the earlier work that I'll discuss very briefly, there are another cohort of grad students, uh, 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 Chris Lowe, Brad Weatherby, um, Kanisa Duncan, um, and uh, uh, Steve Kajira. I'm saying this because you can't do this work by yourself. And I wanna make, make the point that this is the team effort. So let's get into what we wanna talk about. Let's go right into the technologies. We're gonna be talking about two technologies today. And the reason for these two technologies for the simple fact that radio waves do not travel through salt water. So instead of having radio tracking, what we use are acoustic transmitters like these here, because sand travels very well through seawater. And these transmitters come in different sizes from about the size of a cigarette lighter to something the size of a contact capsule or a cold pill. And then the other thing we use are satellite linked tags. And the one we're gonna to concentrate today on are ones like this, that once the animal comes to the surface, because it has to come to the surface for radio waves to work, that tag tries to send its position to a satellite. Well, most of you would recognize that this is not a shark. I actually started off my career as a tuna biologist. And here you can see me putting a small acoustic transmitter into a, a yellowfin tuna. And we would then throw those over the side and follow them around and see where they went and what their behavior patterns were. Sort of like this. And I was happily going along as a tuna biologist until in about 1990 or 1991, something happened. And what happened was we had a series of shark attacks in short succession in Hawaii, and there were a couple of fatalities. And as a result of that, things like this happened. There were shark culls, and as had traditionally been the case, um, fishermen, with, sometimes with the um, approval of the state of Hawaii, would go out to the beach where the attack had occurred and kill sharks. The idea being that if you were to reduce the number of sharks at a beach, you reduce the risk to humans. So the whole question came up about shark culling. Would it be effective? And the students that were working with me at the time said, Kim, the techniques you're using to track tunas around are exactly applicable to tracking sharks. We know nothing about sharks in that modern sense in Hawaii. Why don't we switch gears and get into shark tracking? And that's what happened. So I went from being a tuna biologist to a shark biologist. So we, as our first focus of attention, we worked off of the south shore of Oahu. This area is where we fished for sharks, and we were gonna use those same tracking techniques as I've just described in some various combinations. So we would set gear, usually overnight in those days, in this area off of, off of Honolulu, and in the morning, we would come back and we would catch, we would usually have sharks. Here's an overhead view of a tiger shark. And we like to use small boats because we can get close to the animal to do the tag implantation. One of the cool things about sharks and tiger sharks are particularly prone to this is that if you can get them on their back, turn them over, they very quickly go into a sedated state, which is technically known as tonic immobility. They basically pass out. We can discuss why that might be in question and answer session, but it makes for very convenient processing for the humans involved. And it also reduces very much the stress on the animals. They basically are zoned out. And while they're in this condition, we can implant tags or attach tags to their dorsal fin. We actually catch some quite large sharks as well. And after we've done the attachment or the implantation, then we can take the hook out of the shark's mouth and release it. And very often 
we release those sharks with fewer hooks than they arrive with because a lot of the sharks we catch have already got a, a long line hook or an alua hook in their mouth. So we do our best not only to take our hook out of their mouth, but any other bling that they've got with them when they arrive. Kim, how did you get the shark turned over? That's what graduate students are for. <laughs> um, so typically though, sharks will barrel roll. And when we bring them quietly up to the boat with the hook in their mouth, when they get close to the boat, we put a lasso around their tail and cinch it down. So now we have the shark pinned by fore and aft. It'll roll a little bit depending on how, how tired it is or how green it is. And what, once you get it on its back, you hold the pecs uh, and they will, they will go down for you. Thank you. And in the early days, we were doing what we call active acoustic tracking. You put a pinger on the animal or in the animal, and then with a, a directional hydrophone on the bottom of this pole, you could follow the animal around minute by minute, day by day. Now, we don't normally go as fast as this photograph shows. This was a photo op for the boat, so the skipper put the pedal down. But you, this is called active acoustic tracking. You can do this from a boat like this. You can do it from a kayak depending on the species that you are studying. So this was the early days, and this work was funded in response to those shark attacks by Sea Grant at the University of Hawaii and by DAR, the Department of Land and Natural Resources. So now we've got our sharks with pingers in them and we're following them around. We've caught them basically off of the south shore of Oahu. So what happened? Well, this is what happened. Rather than going back and forth across a particular beach or a stretch of coastline, this shark promptly went offshore, crossed the Kiyivi Channel, and ended up on the Penguin Bank, which, it, which is where we said, thanks a lot, we've seen enough, and went home. What happened to the second shark? The second shark tooled around here off of Barber's Point, and then went across to the Penguin Bank. One of the things you can see here also is the incredibly straight line that this shark took, which is one of those indications that these animals have the ability to navigate even in open water where there's no landmarks. And that's one of the reasons why we started looking at the ability of sharks to detect the Earth's magnetic field in some of our captive research, because that's probably what these animals are using to be able to carry out such directed um, transects. I mean, if, if I close my eyes and try and swim in a straight line down a swimming pool, I don't make it without banging into the edge. Um, and so this is quite remarkable. Um, excuse me, folks, there's, there's a phone ringing. It might be a, a shark related call. Uh, it was that? Hawaii Telecom asking me what's wrong with my service. Oh, okay. um, so, um, so anyway, this is quite remarkable. So this was our first indication of how widely traveled tiger sharks are. They're not just going back and forth across the same beach day after day. And if we added up all of those sharks from that early tracking, this is what it looked like. So here we have many, several sharks, none of which went up and down the coastline, many of which went out to the Penguin Bank, which many of you may know is this underwater sort of mesa that extends out from the southwest side of Molokai. So this was our early indication of how nomadic tiger sharks are and it's based exactly on this kind of research that the state of Hawaii through the shark governor shark advisory board, which I served on, specifically advised that shark culling after an attack would not occur and would not occur with state sponsorship. And so that one little piece of research right there has already saved the lives of many, many tiger sharks because now it's recognized there's no point in going out to the site of an attack after the attack has occurred in the hopes of catching the culprit because the culprit is going to be long gone. We also, those tags that we were using were depth sensitive so we could see how deep the shark was. So the light color is daytime, the dark blue is nighttime, the light blue is daytime. And here's the ocean floor, and here's our shark leaving Oahu, 
going across Kaivi Channel. And then we see these deep dives down to maybe a thousand feet. It's blown up here. And here you can see the ocean floor coming up to the penguin bank. And our shark has arrived on the penguin bank. One of the other things we've learned is that tiger sharks are very vertically mobile. Let's move on to passive acoustic tracking. So rather than just following the animal around with a boat, you deposit, you deploy listening stations at key spots, and they listen for those pings coming from the transmitters, record it to memory, and every once in a while, every few months or a few weeks, depending on the experiment, we go back and retrieve that listening device. It's down here on the, on the buoy on the ocean floor and see what's in its memory. This is an example of one of those receivers on the anchor chain of one of the fad buoys, that, which are anchored fish aggregation devices that are anchored around the islands. And this is an example of at one point where we had an array of those receivers, some on the fads, some close to shore, some around Maui, and a whole string of them down around the Kona coast of the big island. And very quickly, it was reaffirmed what we saw in our early tracking experiments, that we saw evidence of tiger sharks moving back and forth between the islands along the island chain. We had a couple of those receivers parked off of, off of Ala Moana Beach Park. This is Magic Island. This is the Alawai Harbor. This is Ala Moana Beach Park. And these are two of the buoys that were funded in the early days of what is now called pack eyes. And so let's look at what kind of thing comes out of one of those receivers when we retrieve it. This is the kind of record we will get. And each of these lines is a different shark. This is about, a, from one side of this page to the other is about five months. So each of these lines is a different shark. And we know from their individual signature which sharks they are. So for instance, this is a tiger shark we tagged off of Eva Beach. This is a sandbar shark we tagged off of Eva. This is a tiger shark we captured off of Waikiki and a tiger shark we tagged off of Kanioi. And you'll see again something, this is a repeating theme. There might be a month in here when you don't hear it. There might be six weeks in here when you don't hear it. And when there are here, these bars are not very big. They're very brief visits. So this is the kind of acoustic track, passive acoustic tracking which you will see when we get to Maui has become so important. But we also saw some, some records which we didn't recognize. We didn't know who, know who this was, this guy down here in the right-hand corner. And we started asking around to some of our colleagues and it turns out that this was a great white shark tagged by colleagues off of San Francisco. So in other words, we have a record off of sand, off of Magic Island of a great white shark which was tagged on the Farallon Islands in San Francisco. Let's move on to our other technique, which is satellite link tags. This is where you wait until the shark comes to the surface and the tag is smart enough to know that it is at the surface, which is as a wet dry sensor, and it sends a signal to satellite. These tags, there's various kinds that we use, are incredibly sophisticated. They're basically a mini laptop about the size of a pack of cigarettes. And they measure things such as temperature and depth. And they go up and down a few thousand, sometimes a thousand feet from, from 75 or 80 degrees at the surface to 15 degrees at depth and do it over and over and keep on ticking. These are very, very sophisticated pieces of equipment, which a lot of clever engineering has gone into. And the concept is, you know, I hope you enjoy my artwork. When the shark breaks the surface, the tag says, I'm at the surface, and it pings, either to be picked up by the satellite system, or we now have a few land-based receivers on the islands to augment the sparse coverage of the satellite system. We have two colleagues, two citizen scientists on Maui, one Donna in Lahaina and Mark up in Kula that have very kindly hosted 
us putting our receivers up there. So in other words, every time this shark comes to the surface, that tag sends a ping and we hope we pick that ping up. So here we are attaching one of those tags of Waikiki to a tiger shark. Here's a more, a more recent version. This is the most sophisticated kind of tag available at this point. I won't go into the details, but again, it basically works on a principle that when the animal comes to the surface, it tells us where it is. This is a pretty big, probably pregnant female, tagged off of key here. Here's an example of how we work. This is Carl and James and me at work on, on the way off of Kihei, attaching a satellite tag to the dorsal fin of a tiger shark. The tags are attached in a way that they will fall off um, after probably about a year. You can see how beaten up the dorsal fin on this fish was already and how fat she is. Probably that tag, that fin is beaten up from, from going through mating. It's wonderful with these sharks. Once you turn them back up the right way, give them a push, they say, okay, I'm out of here. So what kind of data do these sharks provide us when they come to the surface and try and talk to the satellite? Whoops, I've gone the wrong way. This is an example of one of our sharks. We don't name our sharks on purpose, but we were specifically asked to do so by one of our funders, and this is Kathy. So Kathy was tagged here off of Kaneohe Bay, and over the period of several weeks, was around the island of Oahu, sometimes over Kauai, Kaula Rock, uh, and back again. And then, which is something which we did not expect, makes this huge offshore excursion and then comes back to Oahu. This from here to here is over 800 miles. But Kathy was not just a, a lover of the open ocean. When she came back to Oahu, she actually thought she would take a trip inside Honolulu Harbor. And here's some hits from her right up next to Aloha Tower, maybe checking out Nikos for a meal or something in here. So, what we're learning about these sharks from these satellite tags is really impressive and surprising. Here's another example of a shark that we tagged off of Kihei, was there for weeks on end, went up to the Penguin Bank, jumped off, made a 600 mile excursion down towards Johnson Atoll, came back to Maui, and the last we heard of her, she was on the Kona Coast. So these are the kinds of insights that we're getting. These tracks can be seen at this the PACIUS, which is one of our major funders, uh, at this website. And so with that, we'll move on to Maui specifically. And for this, I want to make it very clear that although the whole uh, HIMB shark team was involved in this, that the Maui portion of our research, although we were all involved in it, the, the lead on this was Carl Meyer. He was the member of our team that honchoed most of what you're gonna see from now on. Just as in the 90s, we were asked to do our research to clarify what was going on in terms of tiger shark behavior. There was a period uh, in the early 2000s where there were more attacks on Maui than we expected. And based on that, DLNR, again, this, this was, Dr., this was um, William Isla when he was the chair of DLNR, specifically asked us if we would look at what was going on around Maui in terms of explaining the shark attack rate on Maui. So we moved the techniques that you've just seen us doing over to Maui, and this is where Carl took the lead on our experiments. But you can see the disproportionate number of attacks that occur on Maui. And it was up to us to try and explain perhaps why that was occurring. And if you look up through 2015, you can see this pattern. And right here in the 2012-13 was that spike, which again settled back down to low levels. That was what inspired 
DLNR and, and PAC IUS to give us the funding to come to Maui to see if we could explain what was going on. But the, there is a bigger, longer story here. And that is we do get spikes in shark attacks, but they've always gone back down to that very comparatively low base level. So off we go to Maui. And here are the hits coming from one of the sharks we tagged off of Kihei. This is a period of about eight months. And each of these, and you can see this on the PACIOS webpage, each of, each of these um, hits is coming from one tiger shark. And you can see it moving back and forth um, between Maui and uh, Kaho'olawe and Lanai, but it'll also take trips around to um, Kahalusai. The colors indicate how recent the hits are. So the, in this particular scheme, you'll see over here, the oldest hits are the purple and the newest ones are yellow. Kim, what period of time is that pattern over? This is over, this, this whole track when it comes to the end is about eight months. Okay, that's, that's good. It wasn't just last week then. <laughs> but there's also no reason to believe it's not still there. That's a good point you make though, Donna, and that is we, we are not using um, these kinds of experiments as real time public safety warnings. Mm. We cannot tell somebody, don't go in the water at this beach tomorrow. This is purely about the biology of the atom. Right. It's not usable in real time. Okay. It, it's very informative, but don't blame me if you see him in the water tomorrow because I won't be able to tell you he was going to be there. So now are you, you can see we're coming to you, the end. Go I'm ahead. sorry. <laughs> are you tracking any other type of sharks like hammerheads? Yes, we are, but not at, exactly at the moment. But we have similar data for hammerhead sharks. Yes. So here you can see a summary of that animal's movement patterns over that eight months. Now, there are ways of condensing these data to sort of see out where the core, uh, oops, wrong way. So here's a summary of the tiger sharks that we've tagged over the years off of Oahu and Maui. And you can see where these points are concentrated. And if we look at some of these individual sharks, Oahu tagged off of Haleiwa, tagged off of Kaneohe, Kahului, Kahului, Kie, Kie. You can see where these animals predominantly are. I want you to look at the red around the islands because that's going to be important. That's what we're calling the insular shelf habitat. And we can do some statistics on those tracks and identify where the core of the habitat of each individual shark is. And these red octagons or polygons, I guess they are, are those core areas. So on Oahu, one of the places which is really a hot spot for our tiger sharks, regardless of where we tag them, is off of the North Shore around Kahuku. The penguin banks are a big deal for sharks from Maui and from Oahu. But look here on Maui. Right in here is the core home range of several of the sharks that we've tracked. One of the differences is there's only one hotel up here, and it's a pretty wild part of Oahu. This down here is a major center of, of, of the hospitality and water recreation uh, industry. And, and water recreation in general. Let's look at this insular insula shelf habitat. We're defining this as the, as the habitat, which is basically from just off the beach out to about 600 feet of water. And you can see here that Maui Nui has much more of this plateau insular shelf than any of the islands, other islands. In fact, it's got more than any of the other islands combined. And if you go back to those tracks that I showed you, that insular shelf habitat is 
the land of milk and honey for tiger sharks for much of their time. Even though we know now they go offshore, it's this depth which is their seems to be their preferred habitat. So uh, Tessa was asking, what are the sharks doing when they go that six to 800 miles offshore? Any data on that? We have no, no idea. One, we don't know. Okay. Um, one of the kinds, one of the things we're doing at our lab on Coconut Island at HIMB is we're trying to develop a tag, which we can actually get the shark to swallow, which will actually tell us when they're eating and how much they're eating. So if we could get those into sharks that are going offshore like that, it might be able to tell us whether or not they're eating when they're on those loops or if they're just going walkabout. My own personal bet is that they're eating uh, seabirds. Hmm. Why they would eat seabirds, who knows? Maybe there's something in seabirds. There's a trace element that they require in their diet, but it's not an uncommon phenomenon. So, so stay tuned, I guess, is the, is the answer. So going back to the shell, uh, insular shelf, this is how much insular shelf area Maui has versus the other islands. The other islands is basically a very narrow halo around the shore. And so if you can see the number of shark bites is very tightly correlated with the large amount of insular shelf. So let's drill down a little deeper. Here are shark bite locations over the years on Maui. Here's where we placed our acoustic receivers, listening for the pings coming from sharks equipped with those acoustic pingers. And this is where we tag the sharks around Maui. One of the things that you find, and I alluded to this earlier on, is that the duration of the visits is very brief, maybe 15 minutes or so, which again goes back to that thing that these sharks are always moving. They're not hanging out. And the frequency of visits, visits per month, seems to be higher on Maui than the other islands. It's not a big difference, but it fits the pattern that we're seeing. This is kind of an interesting slide. These are all from the different places where we have receivers, whether it be on Oahu or Maui. And on the vertical axis, axis we have the number of percent detections per day. In other words, of all the sharks that are out there, how many are picked up on any, on any given receiver in a day? Hmm. And on these receivers, Oluwalu and Pala, Pala Palo Alto and specifically in McKenna, you are we are getting hits from tiger sharks on those receivers, eighty percent of the time. Wow! In other words, there are tiger sharks along that part of the Maui coast every day. And any thoughts as to why South Maui is so attractive to them? There is it's probably to do with food availability. That whole channel running through from, from uh, Alinui Haha down through Molokai is a very dynamic, very, by tropical standards, nutrient-rich part of the islands. It probably um, supports particularly rich um, fauna. Same thing for the Penguin Bank, which is another a very popular spot with tiger sharks. We can't be sure. We really want to get some of these uh, tag, uh, feeding tags deployed in the future if we can get funding. And that will answer some of the questions. Some of the things we don't know is how often, how much tiger sharks eat. But it must be logical that for whatever reason, this part of the Maui Nui complex is particularly attractive for sharks, and let me that for tiger sharks. That brings me to the next slide. Um, if we look at the patterns of occurrence of hits on those different receivers over the course of a day and night, they're pretty flat. There's not a lot of variation. In other words, the sharks are there day and night. 
Now, of course, shark bites are almost always in the daytime. Well, because that's why, that's when people are in the water. But in terms of where the sharks are, day and night doesn't seem to make a lot of difference. So let's go into your question, Dara. Let's look at the seasonal patterns. These are sharks that we tagged around the walk. We got most of our hits in October and the fewest in January. How about the number of Oahu sharks that show up on Maui? They tend to be more common on Maui in January. How about the sharks tagged on Maui? That's pretty flat. So what one way of looking at this is the sharks on Maui stay on Maui. The sharks on Oahu and probably the other islands as well are largely on their home, quote, on home island, but also go to Maui, especially in winter. So you have both resident sharks, quote unquote, resident sharks, even though we know they'll go hundreds of miles offshore on Maui, plus you get tourists coming in from, from Oahu and probably from the other islands as well. So Maui just seems to be a mecca for tiger sharks both resident and visitor. Huh. I don't so, want to take away from your flow, but are you going to talk a little bit about diet? Uh, what, what are they seeking to eat? I can do that for sure. Let's go back a slide. Um, tiger sharks change their food consumption as they get bigger, mm -hmm. older. They start off primarily as fish and crustacean eaters. And as they get larger, they switch to larger prey, and they also, such as turtles, and they also switch into eating a lot of carrion, dead animals, dead animals that wash down streams, dead whales, uh, and so on. And again, we don't know exactly what the composition is, what the relative contribution is, but there's a concept called bonanza events, which is when scavengers, such as tiger sharks and other sharks given the opportunity, come across a huge meal like a dead whale, and they will gorge on that and take that incredible in input of energy to tide them over until the next bonanza event. Hmm. Meanwhile, they're eating a stingray here or a pig that's come down the stream there. Uh -huh. So there's a change in, in the diet as the animals get bigger. Huh. Kind of like going to the buffet at, in uh, Las Vegas. <laughs> I wouldn't know. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, yes, but you, but, and as if you're a kid, you eat a lot of the sweets. And as you're an adult, you eat a lot of the lobster. So you change your diet as you get older. And it's the same thing with these sharks. So the question is, now we've not got a better, now we have a better idea of the movement patterns of shark, tiger sharks, especially in Hawaii. Is there any more rationale for shark culling? And the short answer is, just as we showed in the very early tracking, the answer is no. Because even if you were to fish out sharks, completely fish them out, if that was acceptable, they will be infilled from other parts of the island chain or from even further away, maybe from Mexico or California. This was addressed in a paper by three, two of my previous students, Brad Weatherby, Chris Lowe, and Jerry Crow in a paper, looking in Pacific side, looking at the effectiveness of color. And they laid out a timeline of what happened during the, what was called the tester program, which was a state-sponsored cull in the late 60s that took out a large number of sharks. I mean, you don't have to read the details here too much, but basically over a period of two years, they killed almost 5,000 sharks and 280,000, uh, 280 of those were tiger sharks. And very shortly, shortly after they finished, there was a shark attack at the same place where many of those sharks had been, been caught. So given what we now know about the movement patterns and mobility of sharks, tiger sharks, culling or directed fishing 
still doesn't make any sense. So in summary, Maui is prime tiger shark habitat. As resident and visiting tiger sharks, is probably related to that large amount of shelf habitat. There's very high use by tiger sharks of the parts of the island, Maui, where there's a lot of recreational uh, water use. And there are no really easy solutions to shark bites. Modifying human behavior might help. This goes to a couple of the points that the water safety guys and shark researchers would want to bring home and addresses a couple of the questions that I already have received from some of your, from some of your listeners. Most shark attacks do not involve people being eaten. Most shark attacks are a single bite and people die through shock or blood loss. And one of the reasons why shark fatalities have gone down over the years is because of the first responders and the lifeguards we have around the islands that know how to put a tourniquet on, how to treat shock, how to call for help right away. And also for, for being in the water with other people that can bring you ashore if you've been attacked. So one of the primary pieces of advice from shark researchers and from the public safety folks is don't go swimming or surfing or diving by yourself. Mm -hmm. Either go with a buddy or go into the water where there are already other people that could come to your assistance because it's shock and blood loss that are usually the problems. And those things can very often, even though it's very traumatic, um, be ameliorated. Mm -hmm. I would like to finish off this. As I've tried to make the point earlier on, you can't do this by yourself. This is labor intensive stuff. We've had a lot of help from Maui Division of Aquatic Resources, Russ Sparks and so on. We've had a lot of support, both fiscal and, support and, and logistically from PAC IUS, which is the NOAA uh, agency that's supplying a lot of our funding. United Fishing Agency, specifically my old pal Brooks Takanaka, not Tanaka, Takanaka and Valley Ice Seafood, they give us the bait. They give us the tuna heads that we use for bait. A lot of these wonderful photographs and videos you've seen were made by my ex-grad student, Mark Royer, and Hawaii Department of Animal Natural Resources, PACIUS, Ocean Tracking Network, and Wildlife Computers, the company that makes some of these beautifully sophisticated tags have all supported our research that I hope that I've been able to describe to you today. And I'd be very happy to take any questions? Okay, Thanks well, we've, we've got a lot. <laughs> so <laughs> I've been trying to jot down some notes as we go along because they're I get, paid, I get, I get paid by the answer, right? Oh, there you go. There you go. You're going you're gonna to earn those uh, whale uh, food tips. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, you know, just recently, a lot of people have been asking about if more tiger sharks are coming to Maui to feed on whale placentas or, um, you know, trying to relate uh, tiger sharks to humpback whale season. Is there any study or validity to that? I'm sure that those food sources are used by those sharks. But I'm also pretty sure that the situation has been stable for decades. That there is no thing that we can point to in terms of a changing environment that would indicate that, that there's anything different now than there was 30 years ago. There's one caveat to that, but I'm not sure how important it is. And that is humpback whale populations have rebounded. Similarly, white shark populations have rebounded with the rebound of the California sea lion population. We don't know how important or how relevant white sharks are to shark attacks in Hawaii. We think it's quite small and that tiger sharks are the ones that are, are important, most, mostly attributable to tiger sharks. So there's no reason to believe that anything has really changed on the short term. 
And if they are coming to the islands to feed on placentas or dead whales, that has been going on for millennia. Mm -hmm. Well, yes, I mean, you're, you're tracking them and we're able to see this data now where we, we didn't have that opportunity before. We did have a similar question about the turtle population rebounding and, and if that uh, has any impact in a similar way. Well, certainly the turtles have rebounded and certainly turtles are part of tiger shark diets. Um, but this is the old expression, you can have your turtle and eat it too. If they were, if turtles were a significant regular part of tiger shark diets, we would see that turtle population being grazed, grazed down rather than continuing to increase. Right. Um, I, I don't know, I don't know if anybody knows the relative importance of turtles to tiger shark diets. For one thing, nobody in the modern day wants to do what scientists did in the 60s, and that's go out and kill a bunch of sharks just to see what they're eating. Um, and so that's why we're trying to develop clever ways, tags, that will tell us the same thing. Um, certainly, uh, animals like turtles that have hard parts, like a skull and a shell, tend to be overly important in previous uh, estimates of their importance because they those parts stay in the stomach longer than say huh. a squid does. Huh. Interesting. Um, so, so turtles are important, but um, their levels now are probably what they were you know, 200 years ago, maybe more than that. And, and whether or not that's got anything to do with tiger shark biology, I'm, I'm not in a position to say that. Okay. But you can't have, you can't have, like I said, you can't have turtles and eat them too. Uh -huh. You know, it, it's interesting that, you know, we have had a few shark bites close together. Um, Lance asks, have you compared seasonal studies to the shark bite incidents? Is, is there a more common time for bites to happen? There is a slight increase in the fall, as I recall. But you'd be, yes. But again, you'd be hard pressed to, I wouldn't bet the farm on it. Mm -hmm. They occur all, they occur, shark attacks occur at all times of year with a slight increase in the late fall. Okay. So I'm, I'm gonna switch sharks here for a moment. Uh, Robin asks, how common are white sharks around Maui? Uh, and I think that's because of the recent attack on a kayak in South Maui was attributed to a white shark. Uh, my colleague Carl Meyer has done some analysis on the, uh, on the bite marks on the kayak. Mm -hmm. And he also had an extensive in interaction with the people that were involved in the attack. His opinion is that it was a white shark and it was probably 10 or 11 feet long. We have no clue as to how common white sharks are in Hawaiian waters. We know they occur. We've picked them up, as I said, off of Magic Island. We've heard them up the Northwest Hawaiian Islands, but we don't know how many there are. It's a very difficult question to ask. Okay. Um, my guess would be there's more now than there were 50 years ago because of the way their population has rebounded on the West Coast. Okay. Uh, you're going to get the research assistance on uh, taking those white sharks then? Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> we try uh, and stay inside the boat. Right. Uh, you know, I've had uh, quite a bit of back and forth with with Vernon uh, on the chat here, and I'm, I'm going to follow up with him offline. But you know, several of the questions are related to the Hawaiian community. And through through your research, do you involve uh, the Hawaiian community and uh, indigenous voices and in, in what you're doing and how you're doing it? Well, not on a formal basis, but certainly we talked with William Isla, who is an active um, cultural practitioner 
Hawaiian cultural practitioner, and he was the one that we worked with in setting up the Maui study. Also, when I had the privilege of serving on the uh, Shark, Governor's Shark Advisory Board, I had the pleasure of working with Herb Kane, who gave me his concepts of the Hawaiian concept of Angkua, and with Charlie Maxwell, who was Hawaiian practitioner from Maui. So in designing these experiments, we have had input and have, con and have informed um, Hawaiian practitioners of what we're doing. Okay. What we, what we feel we're doing is augmenting traditional Hawaiian knowledge with modern Western science, uh -huh. because there's no doubt that um, the old timers had intimate knowledge of shark behavior pretty close to shore. What we're adding is something which probably was unavailable, I'm sure it was unavailable to them. Uh -huh. And that is the broader picture of larger scale movements um, to add into that low, very fine scale knowledge. Uh -huh. I, I did mention to Vernon that uh, Maui Nui Marine Resource Council has a community managed Makai areas program and it does work very closely with the Hawaiian communities all, all over um, the, the mm -hmm. island and uh, it is really important to get that input but um, I, that's something that folks should look up on MauiReefs.org. He wanted to kind of get back to some of the, the data a little bit. Um, do we know how long tiger sharks live? Yes, in fact we've We've published a paper on the age and growth uh, of sharks in Hawaii, but I think if we were to give a round number, you could say 20, 20 years. Okay. And then, you know, when you were going over the pattern of uh, when they travel and they, they can go up and down vertically, um, so how, how often do they come to the surface? So when they were leaving Oahu and going to the shelf, uh, what, what's the frequency of, of them going up and down on that journey? It's variable. It, it, the different sharks have different personalities. Hmm. And that's also uh, compounded by the fact that we're relying on there being a satellite overhead at the same time that shark comes to the surface. And that satellite coverage in Hawaii is only about maybe 15% of the time which is why we've added to our arsenal these land-based stations, such as we have a couple on Maui, we're gonna put some on the Big Island, we've got uh, three on Oahu. So those land-based stations, if a shark comes up within their line of sight, we'll know about it. So, hmm. so because the, those, those land-based stations are there 24 seven, whereas hmm. the satellites are comparatively fleeting in their footprint. So it's a combination of satellite coverage, but there's also quite a bit of variability between sharks. And this is also probably true of their, of their feeding strategies as well. S different sharks will specialize on different kinds of uh, hunting strategies. For instance, some sharks make the trip all the way up to the Northwest Hawaiian Islands to feed on that very brief uh, period when, when uh, the birds and the seabirds are fledging. Um, but other sharks don't. So it, just like almost any other animal, there different animals have different uh, personalities, different flavors to them. Uh -huh. Okay. You know, we had an interesting question come in uh, asking what you think of the effectiveness of the electrical bands people wear on their legs, or is there any other protection that people can have while they're in the water? You know, uh, Anne from Maui Reefs said that she carries a tourniquet when she swims with her swimming club. But what should people be doing in the water? Is there anything that they can improve their personal safety? Well, swim with somebody else. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, don't swim near swollen river mass after a heavy rain, because that's where you get the uh, carcasses coming down the stream where visibility is even less than it normally is. So um, being with company and staying out of, out of muddy, rain, swollen water are two of the most obvious things. Regarding the shark repellents, 
And I have to, I have to, you know, preface this by saying this is my personal opinion, but most evidence suggests that most devices are not effective. For, for one thing, their range is so short that if you have an animal which is which has got its which has got its blood up, so to speak, which is intent on an attack, that animal is going to blast right through that supposed deterrent field. Now, if you had an animal that was just kind of sniffing around, maybe I'll eat it, maybe I won't, then maybe you could deter it. The evidence is spotty, but if it was, I think overall, the consensus is that they're not effective. Okay. You know, we have a really interesting um, comment from Barbara, and I'm, I'm just going to read it. I'm a Maui shark attack survivor from November 2016 from a tiger shark. You mentioned that most people were just bitten, were not food. I thought in shallower water that tiger sharks do a bite and then like to allow the food source to bleed out and die. Then the shark finishes the food off. This is to conserve calories. Are the bitten people not food because they were able to get out of the area by rescuers? That's a very, I mean, there's lots of answers to that. I, I think that the majority of, this is guesswork. I'm gonna own up to that. I think the majority of times the tiger sharks bites a human, they realize it's not something they've eaten before and it's not something that's a regular part of their diet. And I think they are in the process of reassessing what they've really done. And more often than not, it seems that they don't come back for a second chance. The, the whole idea of bleeding a prey out is much more the strategy of, of white sharks, great white sharks. They will do that with seals. They'll make a big bite and back off and waiting, wait for the uh, animal to bleed. Uh -huh. I don't think we have that evidence in tiger sharks. Uh -huh. Okay. You know, kind of on, on a related note, Jane was asking again about that white shark attack. And uh, what was reported was that the shark hit the kayak repeatedly and, you know, maybe didn't, didn't know what, you know, if it was a food source or, or what it was. I, I have nothing, I have nothing really to add. I do think though that it does suggest the difference between the two species, mm -hmm. that the white shark, you know, is more aggressive, was trying to actually eat that kayak okay. rather than, rather than uh, a sort of trial bite. Tiger sharks that we have observed in both in captivity and when we're fishing for them, are often extremely cautious. Um, they're 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 very soft almost in the way they approach potential prey, and it seems as if 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 they know that they've been detected, and and or if they detect the fact that their food is still alive, they tend not to go after that food. This is just my somewhat informed intuition based on some observations. I wouldn't want to put it in a, you know, in a scientific paper, but it uh -huh. certainly seems like one of the things we do know is that the vast majority of shark attacks occur when the person being attacked has no clue they are going to be attacked. Uh -huh. So it's not as if as somebody sees a shark and it's, 30 yards away and it's coming towards them and it just keeps coming. Mm -hmm. And there's nothing they can do. That's not the typical shark attack. The ship of typical shark attack is bang, it just happened. And I think that's because these animals, tiger sharks, are so adept at camouflage and silently approaching and making sure of what they've got before they actually make a bite. Okay. Of course, they're not like most of them. And I think one of the things, because they're biting humans, I think one of the things that has to come across in this conversation, the amazing thing to me and my colleagues is not how many shark attacks there are in Hawaii, it's how few shark attacks there are in Hawaii. Hmm. 
if you think of how many tens of thousands of person hours are of ocean users there are in the water <clears throat> and how common we know large sharks are. the fact that we have two to five to zero to eight to two to four to zero attacks per year is really astounding uh -huh. um, right. and and along those same lines we have got absolutely no indication that there's a sort of a bad actor out there that there's a a shark which is targeting humans. There, there's no indication of that whatsoever in, in, in our research or in analysis of the, of the attack files. You know, a couple of people have commented that when there is an attack, the NLR typically shuts down the coast for a mile in each direction. And that could be as long as until the next day. And, you know, from what you were talking about, they, they head off fairly quickly afterwards. Um, so is there any rationale for that policy? No comment. Oh, okay. <laughs> I mean, I can, under, I can understand why they do it. I can understand why they do it. I mean, just for, for instance, this is a purely hypothetical. Say around the corner in the next bay, there's a dead dolphin or a dead whale which is washed up on the beach. We don't know it's there, but it's there. Mm -hmm. And the and the attack occurs on the beach over. But there's there's a certain h higher level of of awareness and perhaps heightened um, in, uh, activity level in sharks because there's a dead whale around. Mm -hmm. Well, in in an abundance of caution, you should in fact check out the area and maybe shut down a couple of miles in other directions for a period of time. Mm -hmm. um, I really don't think that I would want to be go on the record as saying, well, it's, it's never going to have two bites in a day in the same place because you, you never say never. The biology suggests, our tracks suggest <clears throat> that those sharks are always moving. Uh, and especially if the attack is just the one bite variety, which is so common, Mm -hmm. that that animal has got no incentive to stay where it's at. And so okay. keep moving as all of our tracks, whether it be satellite tracks or acoustic tracks, these animals are always moving. Okay. Well, I, you know, I, we're getting close to the end of our time. Um, you know, there's, there's a question here. I know that we were looking at how many we were looking at the movement of one tiger shark in the Maui area, uh, and John was asking if there, if you have an idea of how many tiger sharks are in the Maui area. No, we don't know the answer to that. It's a very, very difficult question. Um, for instance, if you were, if you uh, wanted to know how many uh, trout there are in a lake, you go onto a farmer's field. The lake is this big. There's no way for the trout to get out. There's no way for the trout to get in. It's just natural reproduction. And you can do some tag and recapture studies because you know what the area, what the, what the limits of that pond is. Okay. So you can get some estimate of how many, shark, uh, how many trout are in there. We don't know how big our pond is. So we don't know how far to count. Should we count from here to Mexico? Should we count from the Big Island to Kauai? We, we really don't know. Yeah. What we think is true is that whatever is the case now in terms of popular, population size is probably what it has been for decades. Uh -huh. Right. Well, like I said, uh, you know, it's just been really fascinating. Um, we, we do have you know, a couple more questions, they, they keep rolling in. So I just wanted to encourage people to um, contact you through MauiReefs.org and maybe we can, uh, you know, send you a list of, of questions if, and yeah. do some follow-up. Uh, I'd, I'd, be, I'd be quite happy, I'd be quite happy to do that. Okay, that sounds great. Well, it, it was just amazing. Uh, I, I learned so much, so mahalo for that. We do have a, a few things we wanted to wrap up with. Um, so 
On behalf of our audience and Maui Nui Marine Resource Council, please, you know, thank you so much, Dr. Holland, for your presentation tonight and giving us new insights into the sharks that share our ocean waters. We love all the beautiful ocean and that surrounds us here, and we want to protect our marine ecosystems. And that includes learning about and understanding our marine wildlife, including our valuable top level predators. We thank all of our audience for attending this Know Your Ocean Speaker Series hosted by Maui Nui Marine Resource Council, a nonprofit organization celebrating 13 years of working for clean ocean water, healthy coral reefs, and abundant native fish for the islands of Maui Nui. And I wanted to um, tell you a couple of things about the organization. Uh, m and MRC's projects include ocean water quality monitoring along Maui's leeward shores, visitor education programs, the ocean bio uh, remediation project to improve ocean water quality in Ma'alaya Bay, efforts to reduce sediment runoff in the Po'okea watershed into Ma'alaya Bay, the Limu isotope study, a new pesticide education project to encourage Maui landscapers, homeowners, and property, property owners to switch away from synthetic fertilizers, pesticides, and herbicides that are harmful to coral reefs. And uh, gosh, if you uh, weren't impressed by that list, you know, you know why I personally love and support this group, and they're, they're definitely worthy of your support as well. This work is made possible with the support of people like you and, and I. So please donate to Maui Nui Marine Resource Council at MauiReefs.org. And when you do, you can choose a free thank you gift, including some great Maui Nui Marine Resource Council swag. I, I love their swag. It's very good quality. Uh, we also invite you to participate in a fundraiser that's being held for Maui Nui Marine Resource Council as part of the grand opening of the new Jersey Mikes at 1221 Honoapilani Highway in Lahaina from March 17th to March 21st. When you donate $2 or more to m &MRC, you get a free regular sub. And this is only at the new Jersey Mikes in Lahaina, one, one per visit one per person per visit. Uh, and our next Know Your Ocean Speaker Series event will take place on Wednesday, April 7th at 5.30 p.m. on Zoom. To get news about all of our upcoming events, please sign up for Maui Nui Marine Resource Council's free monthly e-newsletter, Reef and Brief, at MauiReefs.org. You can view this presentation and share it on Maui Re Maui Nui Marine Resource Council's Facebook page. Uh, and you can also view all the past presentations at m &MRC's YouTube page at Maui Reefs. We will also be doing a follow-up interview with Dr. Kim for Island Environment 360, which airs Sunday morning at 9 a.m. on all H Hawaii media radio stations. Thank you to all the businesses and organizations that sponsor Maui Nui Marine Resource Council. And thank you again for joining us. And that is all we have tonight. So really appreciate everybody attending. And uh, please feel free to contact us at MauiReefs.org with your additional questions for Dr. Kim. Good night, everyone. <laughs>